Hello and welcome to another episode of Brave UX. I'm Brendan Jarvis, Managing Founder of The Space In Between, the home of New Zealand's only specialist UX research practice and world-class UX lab, enabling brave teams across the globe to de-risk product design and equally brave leaders to shape and scale design culture. You can find out a little bit more about that at thespaceinbetween.co.nz. Here on Brave UX, though, it's my job to help you to keep on top of the latest thinking and important issues affecting the fields of UX research, product management, and design. I do that by unpacking the stories, learnings, and expert advice of a diverse range of world-class leaders in those fields. My guest today is Dr. Laith Ullaby. Laith is the Director of Insights at Webflow, a platform where people can design, build, and launch powerful visual websites without any coding experience. In his role, Laith leads the organization responsible for data science, user research, and insights operations. Before joining Webflow, Laith was the Director of User Research and Market Research at Udemy, an online learning platform with over 60 million users across more than 190 countries. There, he helped to develop the strategy for both the B2C and B2B business lines. Laith has also held several other positions, including at Uber as a UX research manager and as a user experience researcher at both Google and AnswerLab. And his commercial research practice has been built on top of a very solid and somewhat colourful academic foundation. In 2008, Laith earned a PhD from UCLA in ethnomusicology, which is something that I had never heard of before and have since learned it is the anthropology of music and popular culture. More on that soon. A generous spirit, Laith maintains his connection to the academic world by lecturing grad students at UC Berkeley's School of Information Science. He is also a volunteer mentor for UX Coffee Hours and a volunteer UX researcher for the Wikimedia Foundation, the organisation behind Wikipedia. With research experience that is both broad and deep, spanning 25 countries and encompassing exploratory, generative and evaluative projects, as well as the management of research organisations, I've been looking forward to this conversation today. Laith, hello and a very warm welcome to the show. Thank you so much. Uh, excited to be here. Uh, just really quick, the, the Wikimedia Foundation, I only did that for like a little bit. So I, I, it sounded like maybe you used the present tense uh, versus like the past tense. I don't know. I just wouldn't want to misrepresent that I'm still uh, in, involved with them. So sorry about that. No worries, Leith, and thank you for letting me know. I want to start with something that's perhaps a, well, it's definitely a little bit obtuse, and that's that I understand that you're partial to dried fruit, in particular dried mango. Now, this is something that I don't really understand myself as fresh mango for me is just so good and you cannot beat it, but I'm willing to be convinced to go dried. What can what can you say that might convince me to do that? Yeah, that's interesting. I mean, I am just broadly a fruit fanatic. And <laughs> uh, within that, I think uh, it's sort of like with chilies, you know, like chili peppers, right? So mm-hmm. like fresh chili peppers and dried chili peppers give you sort of different things and you wouldn't want to have to choose like a Chipotle, I think is Anaheim or whatever, you know, and I think there's something similar with dried fruit and also just the consistency. Uh, certain times of the year here, you can get okay mangoes, but um, dried mangoes are just consistently delicious and they're very... Um, shelf stable and just very sort of convenient but i agree with you the like a really great fresh mango is kind of a, a transcendent experience that that is very hard to be so far the best fresh mango that i've had was on a beach somewhere in thailand and i think it was paired with sticky rice Ooh. which is possibly not to everyone's liking but i, I definitely would go back to thailand just for that experience <laughs> yeah in some of those countries it's remarkable i spent some time in india and they're the number of varieties of mangoes is so incredible. You know, at least in the United States, we're lucky if we get maybe four or five, you know, kind of different varieties in there just to see the the flavors and the sizes and the form factors. And that was also a really fun part of it. So yes, very, very pro mango in the world. <laughs> well, now that we've got that out of the way, I'll, I'll bring us to, to something slightly different. And that was something that I observed in a recent talk that you gave. And it was on your bookshelf behind you, actually. I'm not sure if it's, uh, if it's currently the bookshelf that you're sitting in front of. And that was there was a book that was quite prominently positioned and it was titled Winners Take All. And it was by an author called Anand Giridharadas. 
What is this? Is this some sort of Tony Robbins esque self help book? It's quite the contrary. It's uh, he's a he's a journalist uh, and and has done a lot of really interesting look at tech, but through a very different lens. You know, I think that a lot of the standard discourse has been on sort of like tech dystopia or tech utopia. And he's actually sort of taken it from this angle more of sort of wealth and wealth creation and the relationships that people have between organizations. And so, for instance, in the United States, the way the tax code works is uh, we support charities by donating directly as individuals and then uh, getting tax credits for that. And I, I know not every country in the world operates that way. Um, and that creates certain you know, incentive structures for, for sort of how uh, philanthropy works and how our social safety networks and stuff like that. And there's definitely a lot of tech that sort of tried to intersect with that in a variety of ways. And then I think one of the other main uh, sort of parts of that book is just that especially some of the younger folks that, you know, really are appeal to sort of the, the mission driven aspect of work and how corporations have responded by to that by sort of trying to reposition themselves as being sort of mission driven and kind of uh, glom onto that re really beautiful intent that you see in a lot of younger generations. So he, he takes a bunch of these kind of like interesting threads and weaves them together. In a, and a lot of them bump up against tech, I think, in, in interesting ways. So I found it to be just a really great uh, reflection on uh, my role within sort of the world of tech. And then just thinking about the way we both build organizations and cultures within tech. And of course, the impact that tech has on the world. It sounds sounded like he was suggesting that some of the tech companies are being disingenuous with their positioning around mission. You know, that's a subjective call. I, I would probably agree with that thesis, you know, um, and I've definitely been on calls with recruiters and you can tell that they've really honed in that message. And, you know, you, you can make a, you know, second order, third order, fourth order, you know, kind of argument. Uh, but, you know, this was lampooned in the, the HBO show Silicon Valley, you know, where, where every pitch is like changing the world. And, you know, I think that's sort of part of the, the same phenomenon there. And, you know, it's an interesting question, like, do we need to change the world or sort of from that kind of positionality, think about changing the world? I can see it as a very powerful mission to rally around as an organization. I can see it as, you know, an, an important way of kind of recruiting folks and finding folks that are really excited about the challenges that you're facing as an organization. But like all things, you can sort of turn it up too far. It can be used cynically. And I think it can sometimes obfuscate, obviously, the risks and the dangers and the damages that, that some of these platforms are, are very capable of. Now, the position of that book, and it was in the talk that you gave to some students on frameworks, which hopefully we'll get to cover some of that soon, was the position of the book that's prominence in the background, was it intentional or unintentional? I think I can't remember that talk that well, but I think it had been more of just like where some of the question and answer had kind of flowed. And I guess I'd, I'd finished the book recently, so it was very sort of top of mind. Um, but it is a book that I have suggested and recommended, you know, um, on multiple occasions. So I, I do think it's definitely worth a read and uh, very well written. Mm. Did it leave you with any unanswered questions? You know, uh, I mean, I, I think I came into the book with a lot of the same unanswered questions and it kind of deepened the unansweredness. Uh, but uh, I thought that, again, uh, one of the merits of that book that I really like is being able to connect some very different strands as being perhaps part of the same whole. I always love the, the, the metaphor of like the blind wise people and the elephants and, you know, one touches the ear and one touches the tail. And, and it, I think it did a little bit of sort of connecting the dots for me that was that was really useful. Well, let's talk a little bit about connecting the dots and connect some dots for me around your PhD in ethnomusicology. Now, you've described this, and I'll quote you now, as the idea of looking at music not just as sound, but as a cultural practice, a social construct. And I understand that your research for the PhD took you to the Middle East, and I believe it involved traveling to Bahrain and Kuwait what was it that you were trying to understand in those places? Yeah, so you know, you know exactly right. You know, I think there, there's a there are fields of music, you know, like music theory and things like this, which is very much kind of focused on the sound as the sound, especially sort of historically. That's what they looked at, and you know, this kind of interval is you know uh, dissonant, and this one is 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 pleasing, and you know, these are how chords move. And within that, embedded within that really deeply, of course, are social practices, you know, and you can really think about music as a form of technology. And it's such a, a important part of 
you know, how we form identities and memories and communities and, and things like this, you know, the, you know, what is a country, but a, a group of people with a flag and a national anthem, you know, it's, you know, this, this kind of thing. And so, um, yeah, yeah, this was sort of where I spent the, I guess the early part of my adulthood looking into and, and it very much leverages the ethnography and sort of more anthropological uh, research approaches. And my research was really looking at some of these Gulf states and the way they seek to construct national identity and the technologies they used for that. So whether it was the radio or the cassette culture or CDs or you know music video clips, that these became integral ways in which these countries are able to both broadcast internally. So this is what we want to agree with each other as to what it means to be Bahraini or Kuwaiti. And then also sort of that it gives you an opportunity to broadcast that extra as well. So why are you Kuwaiti and why am I Bahraini? And that we can sort of mediate those differences through these uh, cultural practices. So that was kind of the, the main area. And what was it that drew you to that particular region of the world? You know, why study this in the Middle East? Yeah, so I have a family connection broadly to, to the region. My, my father's from Syria, so I think that had kind of been on my radar and I traveled to the region and, and have family over there. I think those cultures are, are particularly interesting. Uh, one of the places I was in was, was Qatar. And if you think about that country in the 1930s, it was one of the absolute poorest places in the world compared to anywhere, right? Just incredibly hard uh, working conditions. They would do, you know, date farming, which was incredibly arduous and they would do pearl diving, you know, pearl fishing and, you know, the, the mortality rate and the, and the, you know, risk of, you know, damage to life and limb was just, you know, super high in these kind of things. And to go from that and literally in the span of, you know, say two generations to being one of the wealthiest countries per capita, um, and, you know, all these countries sort of went through a, a variation of this kind of transformation is really fascinating to me. And, and to sort of try and think about that, that emergence and to go from this sort of, you know, unstructured, um, very informal part of basically part of the British Empire to a, you know, modern nation state in such a sport a short amount of time. And then the other part of it that I find so interesting is just their involvement in the Indian Ocean as a cultural space. So we tend to look at connections as land, but of course, water is a really important connector as well. And so these areas, you know, you would meet the old timers in these countries and they would speak Farsi, they would speak Malayalam, they would speak Urdu, they would speak Swahili, uh, you know, this constant coming and going of people and cultures and traditions, you know, throughout the Indian Ocean. And so it was kind of interesting to look at that and sort of be a part of that. And what was it that you learned or observed across the different countries that you were in as to how they were using music and technology to create those sense, that sense of national identity? You know, were there obvious commonalities or, and perhaps also differences? Yeah, so, you know, it's, it's a great question. And I think at a real high level, the, the sort of trend line that I saw is the governments tended to be invested in one type of authenticity and national pride and, and based on certain things. And they would leverage the, the media and mediums, you know, at their disposal. So the, the big national broadcaster and, um, you know, the music video stations and things like this. But that there was a sort of counter narrative to that that was much more invested in sort of the heterogeneity and the diversity and the eclecticisms and, and some other sort of components. And that tended to be done in this more kind of um, ad hoc, you know, sort of copying cassette tapes and, you know, meeting in person and having these kind of like rituals and events where they could celebrate these traditions. And it, it presented sort of a, a counter narrative or a different narrative of what it meant to be as sort of part of this cultural landscape. So for me, that was kind of the fun was sort of the tension between those two narratives. And, and every country has this. I mean, I know for, for sure the United States does. When you, when you think about jazz music, you know, people ascribe very different values to that. Is it, is it this sort of body, a crass New Orleans, you know, associated with sort of like the red light district? Or is it America's classical music? And sort of the, the narratives that you imbue in that and sort of how that gets put together and what that means and the sort of meanings that you layer on top of that, you know, uh, often are part of very ideological product uh, projects 
for what it means to be in the country. I, I know in New Zealand, there's a lot of uh, cultural heritage comes into play and gets mobilized in, in very different ways than in other, in sometimes in very beautiful and powerful ways than maybe in other sort of uh, countries that have a, a shared kind of colonial history. So um, these things are, I think, are worth looking at, worth interrogating, and worth recognizing that they are human. They're not natural, right? These are human decisions have gone into sort of these these value systems that we put forward. Um, so yeah, I think that that's where it gets kind of nerdy and fun to think about. It almost sounds to me like the expression of the, the music in order to create something to identify with is being based on a story that different groups want to tell themselves about reality. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And you see this, you know, I mean, especially like, you know, I'll go back to jazz. I'm a, I'm a big jazz uh, lover. A lot of my friends are jazz uh, musicians. And it's interesting, you know, when, when someone asks me for a recommendation to go see jazz, I have to like take a step back and I'm like, what is your mental picture? And a lot of <laughs> folks, they imagine like a smoky bar that feels like slightly illicit. And the jazz is kind of like a framing or a background experience. And it's not about kind of like interacting with the music. It's about sort of having this ambiance and sort of taking on, you know, almost like going in a time machine or something. And other folks are, hey, I want to go and I appreciate the technicality and the musicianship and the expression. And, you know, in the jazz world, sometimes they call those like a listening room, you know, where you're really going to expressly listen to the music. And so, again, it's like it's both jazz, but it's, you know, sort of what you're saying, like it takes on these very different meanings and sort of expectations that people bring to those experiences. Laith, you mentioned governments when you were describing your time in the Middle East. What were the the mix of types of governments in the countries that you were visiting? Yeah, so you know they're, they they all have a, a elected body, but you know the it's you know there's a, a spectrum of sort of how representative and, and access. A lot of these countries also have situations where a large majority of the population are, are guest workers, and therefore they have different sort of rights and and protections and things like that. You know, and it's also been even in, in the time since I've uh, done my field work, some of these countries have taken steps forward or taken steps backwards in terms of, you know, how representative they are of the, of the populations they live in. I'm going to put this out here. I'm assuming that most of those countries, their governments had a vested interest in the narrative that they were trying to shape through music and they perhaps weren't democratic at their foundation. And it seems to me that doing the type of research that you were doing in those countries, looking into those narratives, those stories, how music was being used, particularly the counter narrative that wasn't coming from the state, may have exposed you to some danger. I don't think I was in personal danger. Uh, it's it's not to that that kind of heightened degree, but definitely some of the folks I was meeting with and talking about, they weren't comfortable having the interviews recorded. There were definitely uh, topics that would come up that you could just sense the apprehension. So um, I certainly have friends and, and colleagues that have done research that has put themselves in in sort of more of a, of a, of a bullseye or something. But I, I think uh, uh, I was uh, uh, lucky in that it wasn't quite that uh, fever of a pitch of sort of anxiety, at least when I was there. Nevertheless, when you're in front of a participant and they're obviously becoming anxious about the line of questioning or where you're going, cast your mind back to one of those situations and tell me what was it that you as the researcher were feeling and how did you take the conversation forward, if you did, uh, from that point? Yeah, I think a lot of it is, you know, setting the ground rules and sort of making sure that there's a, a clear understanding of, of why I'm doing the research, what I'm hoping to do with it, that I'm an academic in this case and, and, and sort of things like this. And then, you know, being very specific with all the things that we should be doing as researchers, you know, asking for permissions and, and kind of things like this. Um, I think the other thing is in, in that kind of research, it tends to be much more, you know, the spectrum, very unstructured. And so... I think it's also a case where, you know, it's very different from a structure or a semi-structured interview, obviously. And it, a lot of it is much more sort of following the lead of the, of, the, of the participant and letting them tell their story. Sometimes it's about just the classic techniques of like the awkward silences and kind of seeing if they care to elaborate or if they don't care to elaborate rather than kind of making the assumption. Because I think earlier in my field work, there were times I made the assumption and then kind of realized that like, oh, they actually did want to share. And I was sort of too protective or sort of too, I don't know, paternalistic or something and sort of thinking that they should be protected. And, and it actually was a story that they wanted to tell. 
I think it's also a matter of giving yourself permission that you're not always going to be 100% right and that, you know, you're going to have to kind of experiment and, and play things out. The other technique that I think is really valuable and we don't always get to do in the world of sort of applied research in the UX world is, you know, one of my professors uh, did his research in the, in the Amazon and um, this was decades ago. And he said he would never get good results the first field trip the first field work visit. And it was always when he came back that the community took him more seriously, saw him as saw it as like not just a transactional kind of relationship and kind of opened up and, and kind of things like this. And he says, it wouldn't matter if you were there for three months it's or, or six months or whatever. It's like that you left and came back and that that means a lot. And so even with, with my field work, a lot of times it wasn't on the first interview that folks would want to share things on me. A lot of times the first interview was just establishing the rapport and getting the connection and, and kind of getting a lot of that stuff. And it was the second, third, fourth, fifth conversation that, that you got to the more interesting stuff. So that's really interesting. And thinking about that in the context of applied research in the commercial context, do you think that we are missing out on some richness or some depth to the type of research we're doing by not doing that? It's tough. I mean, obviously, I'll give you the it depends answer, you know. Uh, <laughs> I, I think, uh, you know, there's a lot of variables here. You know, I think if you are working on a product that has this ongoing engagement in people's lives, I think that, and especially if it's something more intimate, I mean, as tech has sort of winnowed its way into our lives, it is entering domains that I think historically maybe have felt a little more taboo or that we're less likely to talk about. I think in those situations, there is a great, great, great value of sort of being able to have that like coming, leaving and returning. It does put a higher, you know, it does, you know, one of the risks here is that research is sometimes, sometimes tagged as like slowing things down or, you know, kind of things like this. And so if you say, hey, we're not just going to do one round of research, we're going to do multiple, you're going to have to be ready to sort of really justify sort of the value of that. And there are longitudinal techniques that we use, you know, whether it's a diary study or, you know, kind of things like this. So it's not that it's never done. But um, I do think that that there is something valuable. You know, sometimes we do this in other ways, too. You know, we will have like customer advisory boards in the B2B space. And so sometimes we're bringing back some of our same B2B partners, you know, once a quarter for years. And I think that similarly, they're very sort of straight laced and, you know, superficial in the first couple of rounds of that. But once they've been involved, they kind of let their guard down and you get some some deeper insights um, on and on. So uh, I think with all these things, it's, it's uh, you know, thinking about how you can kind of push the envelope and, and when that makes sense. Now, you're someone who I get the sense is someone who's fond of pushing the envelope. And I say that, I say that because in your f talk on frameworks, you brought up the Carl Jung inspired personality archetypes. And I heard you describe yourself as identifying as a maverick. So how does that nonconformist within you show up at work? Yeah, that's funny. I think I got this a little from my, my father who tends to be a little bit of a rabble rouser and um, but yet works very well within systems. Uh, he's a he's a he's a professor and, and an administrator. And so I think that that for me is kind of the balance is are you adding havoc for the sake of havoc? I don't you know, that's you know, I think some people are sort of like uh, they delight in watching the world burn or sort of whatever the, the, the quote is. And, and I think that's not going to get you anywhere. But I do think just having these moments to kind of step back step outside of yourself and and think about sort of questioning some of the underlying assumptions can be really good just as a self-reflexive exercise and then also sort of thinking about the cultures that we operate in within organizations and so that that can be really fun just can kind of lead to different questions and and for me that's like a lot of the fun part of this kind of work is figuring out what are the interesting questions well hopefully an interesting question and you brought up the the word reflexive there and I understand that reflexivity is a concept in academia in this type of research that you were doing. Uh, and I heard you discuss that previously. And I have to admit, it wasn't something not being an academic researcher that I had heard of before. So just for my benefit, and also for those of us who are listening that don't know, aren't familiar with reflexivity, what is reflexivity and why is it useful? So as a concept, I think it has a ton of merits. And basically, as we've gone through sort of the evolution of thinking about how we, we generate knowledge, 
you know, we've come to this kind of understanding, I think across all these kind of, whether it's quantitative or qualitative or whatever, is that you as the researcher play a role in the production of knowledge, right? We are not sort of this blank slate natural arbiter, but we're deeply involved in sort of the, 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 the knowledge creation process. I mean, simply that, that, that thing that I was talking about, about I'm choosing to ask this set of questions is already influencing sort of the outcome of, of sort of the knowledge that's produced. And so there, there was a move, I guess, maybe starting in the 80s, maybe a little earlier, where uh, social science academics would really kind of explicitly locate themselves within the research. And this is everything from their positionality to, you know, power asymmetries, you know, everything like that. So, you know, whether I'm an academic or I worked for Uber and I went and did research in India, you know, I have to recognize that I have certain privileges and, and things like that vis-a-vis -vis the people that I'm, I'm working with there. Um, and that should be acknowledged in the research. Now, like a lot of things in academia, it was sometimes brought to a sort of ridiculous extreme where it almost felt like the research was about the researcher and not about other people, or it became a lot of navel gazing. So, you know, it's, it's good to not overdo it with these things. And I think that's why I like sort of like the acknowledging part of it. But, you know, we, you know, it's like, uh, don't make it about you at the same time. You're not the main character as the, as the kids say, and, um, you know, sort of finding the right balance. And I think sometimes, you know, there, there's lessons there that we as applied researchers could, could take heed of. Because again, I think a lot of organizations want to approach this as like, we're doing this very sort of empirical science-y kind of thing. And it's, it's so important to acknowledge like our part of the knowledge production as the researchers. So how, in the context of applied research and the commercial setting, how do you know whether you've struck the right balance of being reflexive enough but not overly reflexive? What does that look like? Yeah, it's interesting because, you know, this isn't really something that I would like put in a research report. You know, I, I think my stakeholders aren't going to care, you know, about some of these kind of things in the same way. But I think that when there's a, you know, research team meeting, you know, thinking about some of these things and saying like, and, and it can manifest in a bunch of ways, you know, it can be from sort of like a diversity, equity and inclusion lens, you know, who's getting selected for projects and who's not. It can be from, well, who's getting tasked with doing certain kinds of projects and, you know, as researchers and, and, and not. And just fundamentally asking some of the questions about what relationship do our users have with this organization and how do we want to kind of manifest or represent that in some of our work? So I think it's a good conversation for research teams to, to, to have. You mentioned before that you don't think that your stakeholders are going to care overly about how reflexive you were and the preparation of the research that you're playing back to them. So what is the purpose of reflexivity then like why is this something you mentioned and you can take different lenses like DEI for example and and look at the research through different ways reflexively what is the purpose though what is the goal of this practice you know some of it it does intersect in sort of the more the world of like sort of like research ethics and sort of mm -hmm. acknowledging the power we have as as researchers and that that's super critical but i think it can also inform our research approach uh, you know i'll go back to that example of uh, just thinking of a particular project when i was doing research in india for uber and i was working primarily with with uber drivers in india now no matter what uber says or the lawyers say or whatever you know, these drivers really saw that their livelihood was tied to Uber, right? They didn't see themselves as independent contractors or, you know, some kind of other legal status. They said, I need to make rent this month. I need to, you know, uh, provide for my family. And this is how I'm doing it. They also see me, obviously, my positionality, who I am coming in and doing this research, oftentimes having to leverage translators and things like this. This was very much outside of their, you know, normal experience. Uh, a lot of times it's drivers that are coming in from outlying areas, you know, that are not even sort of urbanites and sort of used to, you know, being in, let's say, more of a cosmopolitan situation like Bangalore. So they're not folks that are going to be super inclined to be like, hey, here's why your app sucks. This is what you need to do. I don't like this. This is buggy, you know, blah, 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 you know, all these other kind of things like this. <laughs> And so I think for me to come in and not acknowledge that difference and the relationship is going to lead me to asking a lot of sort of very obtuse, blunt, direct questions. And I don't think I'm going to get super great feedback out of it. And so, you know, one of the talks I really love and I use a lot with my students is as Steve Portugal has sort of this like, you know, what are some other kinds of questions we can ask? And I love the role play, you know, kind of thing. And so when I was doing this research, I would I, I would come in and I would say, pretend that I'm a new driver and I'm learning how to drive on Uber. I want you to teach me 
how to drive on, on, on Uber. Now, did that dispel all power asymmetries and privilege that I have? Like, absolutely not. But I think it helped to reframe the encounter a little bit. It helped to sort of say, hey, you are the expert, you know this, and you are teaching me, you know, teach me how to do this and opened up some different kinds of, of, of conversations and allowed them to give sort of different kinds of feedback. So just as a, as a little example of it can having a direct impact on how we think about the research that we're doing, um, as well as kind of more just like ethical best practices and things like that. That's a great example of explicitly putting yourself in the learner's seat when you're with a participant. I was also curious to understand whether it's good practice or whether you've ever used the elephant in the room type technique and just directly acknowledge the power asymmetry. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, I didn't do it on that project. Again, it was a little hard sometimes to communicate and kind of do things like that. But but I, I will never forget, you know, one of the formative uh, moments I had um, was when I was uh, at, at the consultancy and I was doing some research for another company and we brought in a participant and she was giving feedback and wasn't like super engaged. And as I was kind of like fishing and, and prodding a little, she was just like, it's fine, you know, it's fine. And then finally she's like, well, they don't make this for people like me, you know? And so to hear that, that kind of feedback of feeling so disenfranchised by the technology. And I remember at the time, like not knowing how to handle that situation. And so just sort of reflecting now, I'm like, maybe I should have, called out the elephant in the room or sort of tried to address that in a more heads-on kind of manner. And I wonder if that would have changed the course of that particular uh, conversation or not. But yeah, I, I haven't really done that so much. Um, so yeah, I'm gonna have to think about that. I think it's a great, it's a great uh, nudge. Mm. Did you ever get to the bottom of, of what it was that lay underneath why the participants said that? Yeah, I think it was just Sort of the idea that, and this was many years ago, so maybe the the relationship with technology has kind of evolved uh, as well. But you know, early on, uh, and to the extent even now, you know, if a new company comes out, they'll re they'll release only an iPhone version first, right? And I get why companies do that; it's cheaper. You know, all the stats say that iPhone, you know, folks, you know, are making more money and more likely to pay for apps and kind of things like that. But at least in the United States, socioeconomically. The, the the lower percentile of folks tend to have Android devices. And so there's this real tangible sense that you're an afterthought. You're you're being built for second and kind of things like this. And you know, I think folks are becoming increasingly aware of, you know, cameras processing power optimized for certain kinds of skin tones and not other kinds of skin tones. And beta tests happening in certain zip codes and not other zip codes. And so I think there's a real tangible sense that technology is not is not being you're sort of an afterthought you know and so once we're successful and we need to expand to new markets then we're going to think about you but you're you are not the first people that we're, we're building for and i think i think folks feel that well wow, that's really illustrates the often unthought of secondary effects of branding and pricing and all the thought that goes into creating premium products i hadn't considered that that othering that's inherent and in strongly positioning a product at the premium end of the market might actually lead people who aren't in that part of the market to feel as if they're second class te tech citizens. That's quite that's quite an interesting discovery that you made as part of that research. Yeah, the the digital divide is with us. It's just manifested, I think, differently than we thought it would, you know, in 1995. Uh, but uh, yeah, it's tough, right? I mean, who doesn't love something aspirational? Like there are, there, you know, I love music and records and, and uh, you know, there's, you know, sort of uh, audio file systems that I aspire to that are ridiculously expensive, you know? So I get it. I aspire for aspirational things. And, and those companies have done a good job making me want to hear sort of like the smallest minutia in sort of the delivery of these, you know, performances. But yeah, I mean, the, the fact that I realistically may have one of those systems in my life, and there's a lot of people in the world that will never have that opportunity, that has consequences. And that's, that, that can be tough to, to navigate. Mm, it's, also, it's also by design. It's intentional. And I was thinking about what you were saying about the audio systems. And for me, the thing at the moment is is whiskey. And I've gone down the whiskey rabbit hole. And, and just like anything, anything that you can buy to consume or buy to collect, it's uh, it's fascinating just how much the role of status and aspiration plays into something as simple 
and you know, I'm not saying it doesn't have a lot of craft put into the way that it's made, but something as simple as a bottle of liquid. Uh, yeah, really quite revelationary for me as to how my buttons can be pressed. Uh, I need to get better at uh, and not responding to the messages at some at sometimes. I was there just thinking something delightful about craft, though. And so, you know, I think that's that's always the struggle with these things. Is you know, for instance, you know, I have flat pack furniture in this house today, and and it's you know obviously allowed me to get furniture and everything's like this, but. Then you see just like a really beautiful handcrafted piece of furniture or quite frankly, you know, a, a, a bottle of whiskey that has just that extra level of care and thought and, and, and point of view put into it that it's not sort of a lowest common denominator, but they're really going for a specific flavor profile for a certain kind of thing. There's something really beautiful and to be celebrated about that, too. And oftentimes for those businesses to be economically viable, there's a price point that comes along with that if it's going to take them you know, six months to make a bookshelf instead of six minutes in the factory, there's going to have to be an economic way to kind of make that work. So it's tough, right? You can't like totally go to one side or the other. So I don't know. I just, I have very conflicted thoughts on this. I'm on both sides. I'm a problem on both ends, you know? Well, I appreciate you making me feel better. <laughs> I, d I just need to get you to talk to my wife so she understands where I'm coming from. <laughs> Hey, Laith, as you've progressed in your career, you know, we were talking uh, for most of our conversations so far about the influence that academia has had in the way in which you have approached research, either directly through your experience as an academic researcher, but also now in, in the field, in the applied research field. Now, you've described previously that the lens at which you have seen yourself has changed and I'm not sure if it's recently, but maybe you can fill in those blanks. And about this, you've said, I think originally I saw my role as I'm part knowledge in the industry because I'm the dude with the degree or whatever, and it's so much more powerful to be the facilitator. So how has that shift in lens changed your relationships with your colleagues? Yeah, I think there's two parallel evolutions that have been super important. And I think when I was earlier in my career, I was kind of a career switcher, right? I'd done all this academic stuff and now I'm coming, you know, and feeling like uh, maybe I'm a little behind, you know, where I should be in terms of my age and sort of thinking of that. And so there was this like, oh, I need to know things and I need to sort of do the things. And realizing, I think at some point that like, okay, I need to have a competency and I need to sort of be able to produce findings and insights and things like that. But the, the analogy I always use is, if I have 60 minutes to share research findings and I have two options, option A is I can talk for 59 minutes or option B is I can talk for 35 minutes and facilitate a discussion for 25 minutes. Earlier in my career, I would have been like 59 minutes. I want to tell them, I'm going to show them how smart I am. I want to show them everything I learned. I'm going to try and jam as much information into this as possible. And as I've matured, I think I've said, you know, maybe it's even 20 minutes that I should be talking and facilitating for 40 minutes or, or, or something like that. And, and having those heartbreaking moments when we were working in offices of the conversation happening as people were getting up to leave and it happening like in the hallway as people are leaving. And then like, well, how do I capture that energy and channel it and kind of things like that? So I think that's one kind of progression that, that's been important to me. The other one is I think earlier in my career, you know, I was at a consultancy. We were a research consultancy. I was coming out of academia. I saw myself almost as like the the, the knowledge creator, the, the scientist. And so, uh, or like an umpire, like an American baseball. I'm calling balls and strikes and, you know, this works and this button needs to be bigger. And that's kind of my role. And we would even kind of lean into the like separation of church and state kind of perspective of like research, you know, working with organizations. And there's a role for that. And I think in certain situations, that's a, that's a not bad way to approach it. But I think I've also shifted to being like, you know, even though I can't code, even though, you know, I, I can't design, I am part of a team that is making things. And so an evolution from sort of a, adjudicator or umpire to being part of a team that is building things and really taking the satisfaction in building. And so I think that's really transformed my practice, those kind of two different um, uh, shifts that happen in parallel. Has there been a noticeable, observable difference in the impact that you've been able to have through research as a result of adopting a different posture? Yeah, I think when I first moved in-house and I brought that kind of like those other kind of perspectives, it, it just didn't work very well. And so I was like, why am I, you know, why was I being so much more successful as a consultant than as an in-house researcher? And so I think, uh, 
it was sort of unlocking those kind of things that helped me to sort of have a deeper relationship and, and kind of work with teams in a different way. And then, you know, seeing the sort of impact of that unfold over time uh, just became really gratifying. You know, there's definitely part of you that seems to be deeply academic. I mean, it's evidenced in what you've done, right, in the PhD that you've earned and the way that you describe the rigor and the joy, frankly, of the type of research you were able to do before the commercial world. And I'm not taking away from any of the joy that you've experienced in the commercial world, but clearly you value these practices. Now, about bringing that rigor and those practices to applied research and the enterprise, you've said, and I'll quote you again, every time I've said, this is going to be too academic for folks to get into, but I do it anyway, I'm surprised by how willing people are to engage with it and learn by it and say, oh, I've never thought about it. What I've found is a lot of very smart people like engaging with complex notions. Why was that something or why does it seem like that is something that surprised you? Yeah, I mean, I, I think there's a, a lot of like layers to this. And I think one of them is, you know, when you're making the transition into uh, industry, academics that, that made the, the jump before me kind of gave the warning of like, don't be too academic, sort of, you know, simplify things and, and sort of things like that. So maybe I'd kind of like, Overlearned or overheard sort of that advice and, and over indexed on it. So I think that that's pr probably part of it. I just don't think maybe I had always appreciated like before I started working in tech, just that a lot of folks get into tech because they are curious and really interested in these kind of things and, 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 and relish in the complexity. And so if you're really interested in the complexity of designing products, chances are you're that, that sort of predilection for complexity is going to carry over into some of these other kind of areas. And then I think also it was just a little on me, like, can I be a better communicator? Can I pick my moments, you know, not sort of be the like constant academic, but sort of pick my moments as an academic and, and, and meet people in that way. And that that's been, that's been really successful. Well, sp speaking of complexity, I think I mentioned earlier on in our conversation that I'd watched your talk on frameworks. And for me, a framework is something that does an inherently good job, or well, depending on how well it's designed, in communicating something that is complex in a fairly easy to understand way. And you talked about frameworks and their benefits as a work tool. And about this, you said, they give us a shared language and understanding so that people end up talking about the same thing. So to me, that came what came to mind was um, I think it's Giddy Jordan's ladder of inference, you know, the ability to integrate perspectives to have an artifact where we can all look at, talk about and walk away somewhat certain that we've seen and understood the same things out of it. So to me, that's uh, the role of a framework. But it seemed to me that you were also suggesting that in the work context, that frameworks uh, things that actually help you to establish context and by result of that can give you more influence over, over how other people are thinking and therefore come to act. Is that the case? Yeah, absolutely. I think that sometimes uh, introducing the right framework at the right time in an organization can really have that like mimetic quality where it kind of like spreads through the organization. It becomes a shared point of reference. And I think it can also help to just spark conversations. Uh, one of the super awesome researchers on my team, Chelsea, has this graphic she uses a lot of time, and it's like three people, and the, the thought bubbles are all different. And then the next one, there's speech bubbles. And it's sort of the idea that like when you actually put it out there, you can see that, like, oh, we're not talking about the same thing. And sometimes it's like going beyond just saying the thing. It's about, you know, coming up with a clear definition. And, and we face this all the time in, 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 in the world too, right? Um, Oh, we say like churn. Well, what does churn mean if you haven't really defined what it is and how we constitute it and, you know, uh, regrettable versus non-regrettable churn and everything like this. And so having like a very superficial understanding sometimes is not actually a shared understanding. And when we can add the framework to sort of get the tensions and get the complexities, we can really make sure that we're, we're sort of talking about the same things. And so, you know, I've definitely seen it and not just from research, but from, you know, any function that someone sort of comes along at the right time and introduces a framework and it really helps to kind of like reorient conversations and, and get to decision making. I think that they can be they can be valuable. Again, like all things, you can overdo it and you don't want to get sort of like bogged down in, in frameworks or have sort of frameworks dictate what you're doing. 
but they're a great opportunity for this like metacognition about, you know, thinking about how we think, you know, just making sure that we're on the, the same wavelength. Yeah, a lot of the time you see people, particularly in product trios, talking past each other. You know, your designer, your engineer, your product person. Yeah. And it's almost as if the verbal expression of what people are thinking of isn't enough. Like there's something inherently useful about putting something down on paper and having a, like a third, creating a third space or a, a second space that people can look at something with. And being able to, and, and there is something just really powerful, whether it's Miro or actually paper. I love paper. I wish we had more paper in our lives, but uh, <laughs> uh, it just lends itself to doodling and scribbling. But, um, you know, there is something also just about like putting two things in tension, like a, something as simple as an X axis and a Y axis and sort of being able to plot things out there can really draw things out. Um, so, uh, you know, embracing the the fig jams and the, and the different tools to kind of get these things out there and, and out of the verbal space, which is, I think, what you're saying, which is which is super important. Mm. And you said it much better than I did. <laughs> hey, tell me. I was, you... I was just yes ending. Yeah, well, I like that. And that's something I, I, um, I need to work on, actually. I talked to Tom Griever last week, and um, we had a good conversation about the power of yes and. And it's, uh, it's definitely something that requires practice. And there are certain moments where it can come in incredibly useful. So I, I like what you did there. Like you have encouraged... UXs to think about creating their own frameworks and doing it as a way that they can do what we've been talking about, get people on the same page, shape the conversation around an issue, whatever it may be, also as a vehicle for making their thinking more clearer. There's something, again, about putting pen to paper that forces you to think through why you believe what you believe and what you're trying to communicate to another human so that they can understand it. And those are all really valuable and important things. But they also sound to me, and having done this uh, a few times, they sound to me, and I know for a fact, that that's quite a bit of hard work. So what is it that people can do to hit the ground running faster when they're thinking about creating a framework? Or are there any obvious problems or issues that you see uh, people must mistakes that you see people making when they first try and create a framework to communicate some thinking. You know what can they do to make that a smoother, faster, more effective process? Yeah, I think the two main areas are, are one, make it playful, and this is why I love pen and paper and post-it notes in the physical world. You know, we've gotten really good with with Miro and Fig Jam and Mural, and I think they're great tools, but. There is something about the kinetic sense of scribbling and kind of things like this. And I think giving yourself the opportunity just to play and experiment and, and these kind of things, super, super important. Um, the other one is, you know, uh, copy and steal and iterate. So, you know, I think sometimes putting the pressure on yourself out of the gate to be like, come up with a organizationally defining framework. Like I would just lock up and never be able to do that. If I say, hey, you know, here's this cool model that I encountered can I tweak it? Can I play around with this and kind of adapt this in some different ways or make it uh, add a layer onto your current process? So maybe you're already doing some affinity diagramming. Well, let's put the affinity diagram on top of a two by two. So as we're making the clusters, we're sort of now putting them in sort of quadrants or so, sort of something like that. And then maybe out of that, we emerge a really interesting sort of two by two that we can use as a framework to kind of share with folks and kind of think like that. And just also that there's a lot of these models, you know, if you do some Googling around for like systems thinking, they're really good at showing like, oh, this is sequential, this is loops, this is, you know, whatever they are. And I think once you start having those sort of templates for these things, you can reference them and sort of build and, and yes and on top of the, the frameworks uh, rather than sort of feeling like, oh, you know, you need to come up with a, something as good as the Kano model tomorrow. Like it's just not going to happen. At least for me, it's just not going to happen. Yeah. And speaking of the Kano model, I mean, even Jared Spool, which many of you listening will be familiar with, uh, Jared gave a, an entire conference talk off the back of the Kano model. It wasn't a model that he created, but he was building some uh, messages on top of that to communicate to the community. So I really like what you're saying there about you don't need to start from scratch. And if I think about my friends who have been in management consultancies, they often over-index in their libraries of these frameworks because they find repeat value in rolling them out to communicate uh, common problems or solutions to clients and their engagement. So there's definitely something in there on just standing on the shoulders of giants and not trying to reinvent the wheel every time. 
Yeah, I feel like it's almost a cliche with management consultants that, you know, they bring out the two by two, but, yeah. you know, yeah. there's a reason why they do it, right? It's a super effective communication device. It helps you to summarize a lot of complex ideas, you know, really effectively. And so, you know, make your version of that and, and, and play around with it. And I think that that's, uh, yeah, there's merit to that. What does that say about us as people at work what is it about frameworks that just seems to cut through some of that ambiguity like maybe i'm answering the question and the question but what is it what is it about us as people that makes us relate or connect so strongly with a well conceived framework yeah i mean there's the whole like anti powerpoint movement you know and i'm sympathetic with a lot of it um and, and have sort of tried to respond to some of that myself and i think it's that we're we're kind of constantly inundated with this like bullet point sub bullet sub sub bullet kind of thing and so you know the human brain likes some variety and likes sort of being engaged in different ways i'm not a neuroscientist but i, I it's probably safe to assume that different parts of our brain spark up when we start seeing things and spatial relationships in kind of different ways and so there's some probably a novelty factor to a degree, but also just that we're able to kind of like think about relationships with sort of different parts of our of our cognition. And there's some value there. You know, we're, we're sometimes able to use things like colors and animations and, and, and figures and icons and some some creative ways. So there's some some value there. And even when we get completely away from the PowerPoint movement, you know, one of the, the responses to that is, oh, we're going to do like a memo and people will read it and then talk about it, it can be hard to put sort of a framework into those kind of memos. So again, it just gives us a different tool that we can we can uh, experiment with. Mm. Speaking of experimentation, it also strikes me that they are tools that are collaborative or can be deployed in a collaborative way, in a way that you might say, let's use you know framework A, but then seek input into the what goes into the framework from the people that are on your team, which speaks to your point around engaging different parts of the brain um, and also perhaps plays into people feeling more of a sense of shared ownership on over something that they've had a hand in, in creating. Yeah, I mean, I love when I see like a, a you know, jam board, you know, a fig jam, and I see all these cursors. It, almost, it reminds me of sort of like ants, in a colony sort of with the shared purpose kind of building something. And, and I love seeing that kind of thing. And, and I think even with like a, a Figma file, when, when someone shows a prototype, it kind of makes people passive. And th there's a time and a place for that. And I think sharing, you know, this sort of really beautiful high fidelity prototype and it's clicking through and showing how the user will experience, absolutely a place for that. But there's also something about sort of like the, just the board and that I think that sometimes can prompt folks to like leave comments or kind of play around. Or I've even seen people like copy a screen and then do a little riff on it over here. So, you know, are there ways of kind of like inviting? I love this point that you're making about sort of inviting folks into the experience and making them a collaborator in sort of the thing happening. And um, again, this is why I love, you know, being in a conference room with sticky notes is everyone get out of your seat, start writing on the sticky notes and let's start playing around. And it really this kinetic shared experience is, is, is really powerful. And I think leaning into those, um, if you'll allow me a little tangent here. So another thing that I'm super uh, passionate about, I, would, uh, I lived in LA for a while and there was a movie theater that would play silent movies. And it was amazing because I would try and watch a silent movie at home on YouTube and I would get distracted and kind of get on my phone and I couldn't sort of concentrate and stick with it. And it was something that I wanted to do, but I couldn't watch it. But when I go to this movie theater that would show it and I'm in this collective experience and other people are responding and laughing, it was effortless to give it the concentration because it was this collective shared experience. And so I think sometimes when we're thinking about how do we deliver research reports or how do we, you know, engender these kind of collaborative things, well, how do we make, you know, how do we capture that, that human element and things like that? Much easier said than done. All you need is you know, one collaborator who's having a bad day and it can be really hard to kind of rally the, the forces. So I don't want to be glib on like, why isn't everyone doing this? It's like much easier said than done. But I think it is a good uh, vein to keep going back and trying to mine and feeling out, you know, how to, how to kind of like uh, uh, mobilize it in different ways. Just yesterday, I started rereading Jesse James Garrett's the elements of user experience. And in the opening chapters, he references that old adage that content is king. And when you were talking about 
going to the theatre and how it was so effortless versus trying to watch the YouTube video at home, I was thinking to myself, context is king. And in the, in the case of trying to influence people in a setting where you need them to participate in something, the context matters probably more than the, than the actual content. It's the context that, that people find themselves in, either engenders them to you know, lean into the activity or, you know, for, for uh, want of a better word, lean out and be distracted by all the other things they could be doing or thinking about. Or the, you know, the medium is the message, you know, it's almost like mm. the context is the content, you know, in, in, yeah. in, in that sort of capacity. Yeah. So we've been talking largely about the benefits of frameworks and how they can be used and the sort of happy byproducts of involving people in frameworks. Now, the purpose of a framework, in, in terms of my framing of it, is to frame something, right? It's a powerful tool for framing a conversation about something. And it seems to me that using a framework could also potentially make it difficult because of that pow that powerful nature of the frame, could make it difficult for people to think outside of the framework itself, outside of those bounds. Is, is this a, a rational fear of mine or is this something that you've also observed? No, I mean, and I think this is sometimes why we were talking about management consulting, the, the two by two, you know, can you really encompass so much with sort of just two, you know, axes? You know, and this is why then people start adding colors or icons or shapes or, you know, trying to represent a Z axis in some way because there's limitations and you can box yourself into some of these kind of things. You know, I think like any tool or any technique, you have to be very cognizant that it can lead you, it can sort of add blinders and, and kind of uh, be limiting. And so use these as a jumping off point. Don't sort of make them destiny. But, you know, for me, you know, if I see a researcher that's put out like, six research reports in a row and none of them have any sort of visualization of this nature you know i'd be like hey you know maybe we're leaving something on the on the floor here on the flip side if every project the third slide is a, is a two by two i might be like hey maybe we're kind of on like automatic pilot here and we need to make sure that we're not just kind of you know doing this as a, as a rote practice yeah Let's shift gears and talk about something that we've touched on briefly, which is ethics in research. And I, I know that ethics in academic research has its own it's its own thing, much more mature than what we have going on here in the commercial context. But I want to start from the position of the participant with you, if I may, and that is by being researchers, we're in a position where people let us into their lives. And whether it's a small window or a big window, the nature of the research will determine that. And about this, you've said, and I'll quote you again now, to talk with people on these very intimate levels and learn their stories and their experiences, it's really a privilege. And it's incredibly powerful to see the world through their eyes in a way that you wouldn't otherwise. So how do you ensure that what you are learning through those conversations, through this privilege from people is essentially their vulnerability isn't something that ends up being used against them somehow. It's tough. You know, I think there's, you just kind of have to acknowledge that. And ethics in research is not an end point. It's a constant struggle and it's a constant thing that we have to be mindful of. And it evolves over time. You know, we have sort of personally identifiable information. Some folks in the development community have been looking at community identifiable information. So are you doing research somewhere and that allows the government to target a community? You know, that's something that, you know, you might not have thought of as much until we start thinking about sort of like big data and, and you know, kind of things like that's being leveraged. So it's a constantly evolving constantly, you know, the thing that we have to be very mindful of. And and I think that's why I, I sort of try and lead from this perspective of me doing this and me having access to these worlds is a privilege and I need to uphold my responsibilities. This isn't a neutral thing, but now I'm in debt and I need to sort of uphold in, in good sort of conscious sort of what I've been, been given access to. And so that's a bit of a mindset. That's not necessarily a technique or approach or a, or a tactic. But I think that it's an important starting place. But what I tell my students when I talk about this a lot is, is the study that, that stuck with me the most is they were trying to do uh, um, research once about what leads to unethical behaviors. Who can we sort of predict is most likely to be susceptible to practicing unethical behaviors, right? And what they found is that the two things that correlated strongest were people that were creative and people that were smart. 
because how a lot of unethical practices happen is we concoct a story to explain our own decisions and our behaviors to make ourselves feel okay with the things that we're doing that we probably know aren't right. And so the smarter you are and the more creative you are, the easier it is for you to sort of create these stories that you can sort of make believable to yourself. So, you know, I think that this is a sort of a good reminder, like your intelligence and creativity is not a strength in ethics, it's a weakness. And so if you think of yourself as a creative person, you have to sort of be doubly mindful about your ethical conduct um, in relation to the people that you're working with. As an individual, is it enough to be mindful or is there a role in here for a another person or a body to oversee this? Because it's again, I'm there's a load well, there's a loaded question. Clearly, I'm expressing part of what I feel about this and the way that I'm asking it, but it seems to me that it would lead itself open to manipulation if we leave, we leave individuals in control of what is deemed to be ethical and what is not. Yeah, this is tough. I mean, I definitely heard folks that have put forward, uh, you know, certification, you know, and, and sort of good standing and, you know, license to practice. And, and there's probably a very, very good argument for that. I don't know how realistic it is. You know, we don't have any kind of governing body. There's a lot of uh, complications to that. And so I think uh, the folks that are working on that, I think should keep working on that. I think it's a good vision. I think, you know, well that, well that either evolves or doesn't evolve, you know, organizations also need to be mindful. So I know, you know, certain organizations, they kind of have set up a little bit of an internal review board or, you know, made sure that there's a, um, you know, legal check on certain kind of projects so that, that, you know, some, some organizations are trying to mature here. Again, I think a lot of the variations here, there's just so many permutations that it, that it's hard. If you're in a B2B space, it's, it's a lot harder you know, I'm just making this up, but, you know, if it's Salesforce working with Toyota and they're, you know, doing user research on how Toyota is using Salesforce products, and I don't know if they do, I'm just sort of picking two mega corporations, there's probably a lot less worry about unethical practices or, you know, they both have these huge teams of lawyers. So if anything does get contentious, that can sort of be adjudicated through any number of mediations and channels. It, of course, gets much more complicated if we're doing something in civic tech and it's about, you know, folks that, that you know, are re-entering society after a, a stay in prison or we're doing something in health tech and there's closely held, you know, um, uh, health information that's being sort of traded on or, or sort of being uh, used in sort of different ways. And in those situations, you know, I think it's, it really is incumbent on companies to really anticipate, really build out the safeguards. And so to your point, it's not just one person being like, this feels ethical and that, you know, you can get sort of more eyes and more perspectives on it and kind of things like that. But I think it's going to be hard because we're operating in such different environments to sort of make a, a universal one size fits all approach. But um, I would love to be proven wrong and, and sort of uh, build that. I'm assuming for your PhD, you had to get ethics board approval or something of that nature. Yeah, uh, you know, for a lot of the projects in the kind of work that I do, and I think some anthropologists, you go through the process to get a waiver. So you still have to um, submit a lot of information and it gets reviewed, but it basically is saying, we don't believe that there is a uh, risk to human participants. And so you can kind of go and do your thing. So, you know, who knows, maybe I should have had a little more oversight than I, than I had, but at least there is that perfunctory step of, of, of kind of checking that out. What, if anything, have you brought from your academic training forward into your applied practice in, in this uh, realm of ethics. Are there any things that you do as, a, as a, a matter of habit now or that you encourage the people in your team to do or are there processes that you've brought forward? What, if anything, have you, have you brought into your practice today? That's a, that's a good, great question. You know, I don't, I don't think there's any kind of like step level thing that I've introduced that is amazing. And, you know, if you do go and look at the Market Research Association Code of Ethics, if you go and look at the UXPA, you know, Code of Ethics, like they're actually fantastic. And I always recommend junior researchers and, and, and designers and folks to look at those things and incorporate them. And, you know, there's, a, you know, I think I found what's like a European Association of Market Research. So there's a lot of really great, you know, frameworks and, and things like this for ethics that have been developed specifically for folks working in industry. So, the, the the push I would actually do there is I don't know how many applied researchers have really engaged with all those practice, you know, sort of lists and checklists and are really conversant in them. 
And I would actually encourage folks to go there first before you sort of try and figure out what you can port over from different, you know, academic practices and things like that. And I wish that they were a bigger part of our conversation. Mm, that's a really good practical uh, piece of advice. And I'll link to those in the show notes if people are interested in checking those out. I want to come back to what you were saying earlier about people who are smart and creative, which I would imagine describes everyone listening to this podcast, including you and me, that we're better at kidding ourselves about our bad behavior or making ourselves, ex giving ourselves excuses for doing things that might not be uh, that great for other people. Given that this is a thing, that we know this to be true, does this mean that we should cut some of the tech bros a bit of slack for some of the things that they've created by moving fast and breaking things? That's tough. I mean, it's so easy to judge. And I think I always want to sort of approach these things from empathy, but I think we can still be very critical. And so I think finding sort of that right balance, I think that certain business models will lend you to having to rationalize certain behaviors. And so I think, you know, there's this a lot of discussion now about that we've built a lot of the internet today on the business economy. I mean, on the sort of attention economy and on advertising. And that has had real consequences in terms of how to make sustainable businesses. And you know, when, when you think about practices that, that feel less problematic, again, like the B2B space just feels so much less complicated because the, the power asymmetries are different, the relationships are different, the monetization is more explicit. You know, uh, you wanna use this product? Well, here's the contract. You either sign it or you don't, you know, there's oftentimes two or three competitors. It's not sort of based on network effects and attention and eyeballs and, and kind of things like that. So I, I'm sure there are critiques we can make uh, of, 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 of a big corporation like Salesforce, but it feels like the conversations are very different than when you think about sort of like the world of social media and the impacts that maybe the tech bros have sort of the decisions that tech bros have made in those kind of things. And, and you can probably find, you know, similar things like, again, I'm, I'm sure there's critiques we can make of, uh, of uh, Stripe, but it's a very different conversation than, you know, some of these other kind of platforms. So, you know, I think that when people set themselves up with certain kinds of business models, they had to have understood that that was leading them in certain to incentivize certain kinds of behaviors and business models and sort of things like that, that that, that becomes something to, to think about. So, you know, it, I think if you are a researcher or a designer or a product manager and you're in your this is something really top of mind for you, you know, start with the business model and kind of work backwards from there and say, you know, is this a business model that is likely to put me in a case a situation someday where I'm going to be tempted to come up with this story to rationalize an action because we need to get to profitability and that. You know, I don't think that conversation is the same for every sector and every, you know, monetization strategy and, you know, everything like that. So I don't know, that would, that, that's sort of what I'd be thinking about. That's a really good framework or, or question that you've touched on there. And I know there's a framework that you've also spoken about in the past called the ethical operating system. And from what you were describing there, it seems to me that that might be useful in helping people to think through some of the things like business model and therefore what some of the decisions that they may have to make in the future may be and whether or not they are going to lead to ethical or unethical outcomes. What is the ethical operating system? And, and why is it something that you feel is, if you do feel this, that people should check out and have a look at? Yeah, there's a, there's a few parts to it. And I think it's a wonderful, wonderful sort of, there's a great website and a lot of things. And, you know, no one, I think, enters the world of user research with sort of like a, a strong suit across the board. We have to have so many different skills. And, and so oftentimes we, we need to build those up. And certainly coming from academia, like the whole business angle was very foreign to me. And it's an area where I've had to sort of do a lot of self-education and you know listen to folks much smarter than me and kind of understand. And so that sort of conversation about like, what is a business model and, and how do organizations operate and, and run and profit and loss and all these kind of things, uh, it really came slowly over my my career. And I feel like I kind of have a handle of it now. I mean, I'm sure there's a lot of things I could get better at. And so for me, one of the reasons that's really great about the ethical OS, OS is it really speaks to those kind of conundrums really directly. And again, gives you a framework so that you can kind of parse out the different um, elements of it. And then the other thing I really love about it is each of the kind of like risk zones 
is a, there's like a, a checklist that you can find as well and kind of interrogate where you are. So you can sort of um, actualize or leverage, you know, really directly leverage that. The other thing I love about it is that they're risk zones. It's not saying you do this, I'm gonna shake my finger at you, or this is instantly bad. And that the other part of ethics a lot of times is that we don't start off, we don't go from like zero to a hundred instantly, right? Oftentimes it's kind of this gradual drift of a million little decisions that get us into these kind of like bad situations. And so by having this framework, being able to kind of, again, step outside of ourselves, reflect, have the checklist, we can see if we're kind of like drifting into these risk zones or if we're on a more of a solid footing. So yeah, I think it's a, it's a tremendous resource. That makes a lot of sense. And one of the questions I was going to ask you was about that drift, about those series of small decisions that happen across time. And I'm assuming in the complex nature of enterprise across different functions, what the role or the point of having an ethical code is, if that's the case, but you very clearly cleared that up for me, that actually having that code, having those checklists in place is the thing that can prevent that drift from happening. So that's um, that's much, much clearer for me now. Lath, I'm mindful of time. I wanted to touch on something, one other topic just before I bring the show down to a close for us, and that is democratizing research. And back in April of 2020, you said, and I'll quote you one last time, when I think about democratizing research, it's not just about letting a designer go and being the gatekeeper and letting them go and do some usability sessions, but it's about having them be more involved in the process and feeling that we're all designers, we're all researchers, we're all product managers, we're all engineers. Now we have specializations within that, but we're building together. This is an intentionally provocative question. How much product management or engineering have you had to do as a UX researcher? Ooh, that's a, that's an interesting twist. Uh, I, I feel like I have done a little project uh, product management uh, at a very light level, but there's certainly no no engineering. Why I'm asking this to be and to put to put a f fine point on this question is not to haul you over the coals for what you said back in 2020, but just to give you a an opportunity to revisit that position on the democratization of research. And I'll get to a question as I'm thinking it through as I go. And what I was curious about was given what we've seen with the upheaval in tech recently, particularly with research teams being affected, uh, perhaps more so than other areas of tech with the layoffs, whether or not you've reconsidered your view on democratization as to whether that's been a positive force for UX research and in, in enterprise. Yeah. I mean, I think some of this is just also stemming from my personal philosophy in life that whenever we feel an inclination towards gatekeeping, that we should reassess and sort of think about that. Now, there probably are things in life that are worth gatekeeping or that there's reasons for gatekeeping. So, you know, don't want to sort of do it in a doctrinaire way. I think one of the things I was trying to stress there is that I feel that a lot of the LinkedIn and Twitter hot takes that maybe I've seen really make it feel like this binary choice, like you're democratizing, you're not democratizing. And for me, it's really like a big spectrum. And so, you know, one of the the, the uh, research projects I enjoyed the most, I remember um, I went uh, to Mexico City with a, a designer and a PM, and we had two days of user interviews. And the first day I led the interviews and they were kind of note takers and kind of hung out. On the second day, so they'd seen me go through the moderator guide six or seven times at that point, they'd really internalized it. I ran two parallel rooms. I continued my research in one room and we'd recruited double the people the second day and they did it in the other room. Like, I, I don't know, for me, that's not like a matter of like, well, I'm not, I, I wasn't asked to do design work. I wasn't do, asked to do product work. It's a matter of saying, you know, we have this amazing spectrum and continuum can we find ways to get more folks engaged in different ways and kind of things like that? Like, I don't feel that at any point my expertise or my credibility or anything like that was undermined by kind of like opening things up. I felt like I still had really good guardrails and an understanding. I felt like I was still able to really do the research that I needed to do and the things like that. And so, you know, on one hand, even just having them there as note takers hanging out, like for me, that's that's not an end point on the spectrum. You know, it's somewhere in the middle. And I think you're going to have to, you know, everyone is going to have to sort of calculate where they are on that spectrum and what's appropriate and their stakeholders and things like that. You know, I've had designers that were formerly user researchers and are now have a design title. It seems weird for me to be like, well, you know, you don't currently have this job title, so you can't 
do research now, but you could, you know, a year ago when you had a researcher job title. So I think just being able to kind of like step back and thinking about these things in, in, as, as this really rich spectrum with a lot of variation. Now, the point that I think you're getting at, which is super important, is what is the motivation for democratizing? And I have certainly been in situations where uh, a head of product was really pushing for democratization, and it's because they don't want to invest in research. They probably have a low maturity in how they think about research and what they want to do with research. And, and if that's the motivation, okay, let's pump the brakes, let's talk about this, let's sort of reanalyze and, 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 and engage with that differently. So I think that like, again, you know, what's the spectrum? And it's not just a, a unipolar you know, spectrum, there's probably like multiple axes that we can sort of plot out and think about uh, different activities and how to engage with it. And then what is the motivation? Because I think that if I see a, a research team that's being laid off at an organization, there's probably a deeper problem there where fundamentally that research, the, that leadership team is not engaged in research in the right way, or the leadership team is making decisions like they don't want to hire their buddies or their direct reports, and they don't have the courage to, you know, it's easier to fire people that they that don't report to them directly. You know, I've heard of situations like that kind of um, as, as a diagnosis. So I don't know, I wouldn't want to conflate sort of like the, 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 the two things, because I think that they might overlap in some situations, but if you were if you're getting laid off, I don't think it was because of democratization. There's probably a more fundamental lack of maturity and engagement with research would be my guess. But I like the provocative question, and I think it's a good thought exercise um, as as well. Well, let's see if you if you like this next and final Ooh. question. <laughs> so, with all that upheaval that I was mentioning there in tech at the moment, with the, the layoffs and the economy looking pretty shaky including things recently like the mainstreaming of AI, which I know is being covered ad nauseum everywhere at the moment. It seems that, at least to me, the field of UX research is at a really important moment in time. And it's a moment where we get to make some choices about how we take the field forward. And hopefully it's a position we find ourselves in where we're able to do that and still um, invest in this area that we that we love and that we put all of our time, energy and effort into, at least at work. Now, you once suggested as a thought experiment that UX researchers ask themselves a question. Now, I said I'd quote you one last time in my last question, but I promise this is the last time I'll quote you today. And what you said was, if we were to redesign design research today and could somehow throw away the baggage and history of all these things, how would we design it differently? So, Laith, what would you throw away? How would you design research differently? That's a tough one. Let me think, I, I, just for a little context, I think it is important. I think one of the things I was trying to make in the context of that quote was that historically design research and, and sort of the antecedents that have kind of fed into this, a lot of times um, this work, you know, for a long time existed in um, like innovation labs, like your Xerox Park and things like this. And then we went through a phase where a lot of this work, both design and research was done on agencies. And so in-house teams were very small. And you know the fjords of the world and adaptive path and all these you know IDEO and all these amazing firms, but they tended to be outside of organizations. And it's really been I don't know if we can put an exact figure on it, but over the last let's say 15 years, there's been this real ramp up of of, of you know uh, companies uh, you know uh, acquiring Bolt Peters and adaptive path and sort of building out these big in-house teams. And so I think one of the points I was making there was that like we have this legacy of sort of being the consultant or being the outsider. And I see it in how sort of people prepare research decks and how people uh, even do, you know, design reviews and kind of things like this. So it's very much this like legacy of I'm the outside consultant and, you know, and that's kind of been moved in. So uh, I think that if we did redesign um, these these fields today with the idea that, no, we're part of teams, we're, we're embedded and uh, deeply um, a part of how an agile team functions and things like this that at the very least, some of our nomenclature or some of our rituals, uh, you know, it's always funny to me when someone, a researcher is on a team, uh, they've been on that team for a year, they've been working with a relatively set of stable, uh, you know, stakeholders for a year. And the first few slides of their research report, 
are the same as if they were, you know, coming in as a consultant from the outside. And it's like very formal and sort of, you know, things like this. And I'm like, what, what, why does this relationship have that as sort of this artifact and that there would be different ways of, of questioning it. Now, to your point about AI, there's, I think there's, uh, you know, uh, a really awesome research manager I worked with recently called it AI fever is sort of slow sweeping the world. Yeah, I think there's a lot of open questions there about how we interact and interplay with that. And what are the tasks that, we feel we add value to and not. I mean, it's really interesting to see, there's definitely some startups out there that are trying to say like, hey, we can do the affinity diagramming for you. You know, we'll do a transcription of your user interview and we'll do the, the affinity diagramming. I don't know, maybe, maybe it'll be better. And maybe that means that the, research can focus, the researcher can focus uh, time on other things. There's sort of chatbots now that are helping uh, sales folks learn how to do better sales calls and things like that. Uh, uh, an awesome PM I, I worked with before has had the idea of like, what if we have this chatbot to help train you how to ask better uh, follow-up questions, right? One of the hardest things for researchers to do is to learn and get practice in, in terms of how to do follow-up probes and, and follow-up questions in a user interview. Could, couldn't we have an AI, you know, sort of interlocutor so that we can get better at asking follow-up questions? I mean, those kind of things I think are, are really exciting and being able to leverage them. But I mean, I, I'm just sort of, speaking off the cuff here. Well, here's something that I'm not sure how excited you'll feel about it, but I'll be interested in your take. I was contacted by one of the founders of a, a new AI-infused product called Synthetic Users recently on LinkedIn. And the premise is, is pretty clear by the name. It's conducting user research with an AI that is able to simulate different types of people that you may wish to do research with. I have to admit, I haven't looked into it much more deeply than getting to the homepage and being personally somewhat horrified and intrigued at the same time and made a note to come back to it. This was just yesterday. But what's your take on that? Yeah, I mean, my question would be like, what are, what are, what, what are the kind of meaningful inputs? Because, you know, I love uh, working with data science and, and it's a super important thing, but there's always the limitation of, you can only do research in that vein on data that you can collect. And so where did people tap? How long were they there? All those kind of things. And so, you know, if I'm thinking about like just TikTok or something, for example, it can see how many times I like and how quickly I scroll. And I think that you could develop some interesting, you know, um, you know, machine learning models or, you know, things based off of that. But there's so much of the experience that happens you know, maybe off of the screen, you know, maybe me setting up my camera to like record something or me doing a, a um, edit on a, another piece of software that I integrate or how do I get Instagram and TikTok to sort of work well together. And so, you know, my question for a platform like this is, you know, can it scrape sort of all the complexity of the online and offline interactions to, to, to weave that into a, a composite that can generate the user experience? Because, Oftentimes, like those are the places where user research is most valuable because all the other stuff, a lot of times, you know, data science can do that work better and, you know, in, in, a, in a quicker turnaround than we can anyway, if it's, you know, that we're basically caring about where folks are tapping and swiping and, and how many milliseconds they're spending on something anyway. So I don't know, maybe they have a, a magic potion where they can, you know, get natural language processing of Twitter users and triangulate that with, you know, some other kind of data source. But until they can capture the sort of offline and the ecosystem behaviors and not just what's sort of happening on a specific platform, um, I think it'll be really hard for them to make a synthetic user. But I mean, it's a brave new world. So, you know, maybe they, they've, uh, they've gotten to something else, you know. It's almost like our job is, the purpose of our job is to understand what hasn't already been understood. And by virtue of that, that is not information, data, knowledge that can exist in any known data set until it's discovered. Yeah. So I, like hearing you talk about that and then reflecting on that, I feel like we're going to be okay as far as synthetic users go, uh, but I 100% agree that there's a huge amount of productive benefit that we could leverage from these technologies and the way in which we conduct research. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, one of the discussions I've been hearing is like, you know, AI is generative versus AI as co-pilot. And I think that it'll be really, I think at least for a lot of user research in the foreseeable future, there's probably going to be some really exciting ways in which we can use AI as co-pilot 
I think the generative side is is probably a, a little bit more, you know, over the horizon and, and in the murky um, unknown future. Well, Laith, this has been a really enjoyable, wide-ranging and thought-provoking conversation. Thank you for generously sharing your thoughts and insights with me today. Pleasure. A uh, really fun conversation, so it was, it was my pleasure. Oh, definitely my pleasure. I really enjoyed it. And Laith, if people want to connect with you, they want to understand what it is that you're up to professionally, anything that you're contributing to the field, what is the best way for them to do that? Yeah, I should probably up my game there. Um, I'm on LinkedIn, always open to, to LinkedIn uh, connections, but I don't I don't tend to publish a lot of uh, updates or, or, or sort of things like that. But um, uh, love connecting with smart people and seeing what they're publishing because that really you know informs my my practice. Thanks, Leith. And to everyone who's tuned in, it's been great to have you here as well. Everything we've covered will be in the show notes, including a couple of links there to some of those code of ethics that we covered and where you can find Leith, all the good things. If you enjoyed the show and you want to hear more great conversations like this with world-class leaders in UX research, product management and design, don't forget to leave a review on the podcast if you're listening on a platform where you can do that. Those are really helpful for helping other people people to find and understand what it is that we talk about here on Brave UX. Subscribe so it turns up weekly and also pass it along to someone. Maybe it's just one other person that you feel would get value from these conversations. If you want to reach out to me, you can find a link to my profile at the bottom of the show notes on YouTube and on the podcast platforms. There's also a link to my website, which is thespaceinbetween.co.nz, thespaceinbetween.co.nz. And until next time, Keep being brave.